Good day, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see you, whether you are here now or whether you're watching this as a recorded event. We're thrilled to see you. This last weekend was commencement and Northeastern hosted four commencement ceremonies in person at Fenway Park. And they were fantastic, truly. And they were just yet another example of the can-do attitude of our wonderful university. Our graduates were there in person, so excited, each of them with a guest. We had wonderful speakers, we had live music, and it truly was a celebration of the power of Northeastern and the power of our education and of our wonderful graduates. It reminds me so much of the power of what we have in the College of Science. In our College of Science, we promote the power of science that has carried us through this pandemic and has allowed us to triumph over a very difficult, very dangerous virus. We are getting back to being in person together because of the power of science and also because of the power of science, we're able to meet in ways that are not always in person, but still very effective. I am so glad to welcome you today to a talk by one of our, let us say, mid-level professors in the College of Science. In the physics department, which spans, as, as Professor Williams, who's chair of the physics department, will tell you in a moment, our physics department spans the gamut of physics all the way from the tiniest particles, from strings, which may be the fundamental building blocks of the universe, all the way through molecule atoms molecules and to even larger entities um, in biophysics and life sciences and indeed to the cosmos, the entire universe. The physics department is a fantastic set of disciplines, of exciting fields and of exciting questions that are being posed and answered by a truly eminent and um, wonderful group of investigators. Professor Manny Wanunu is one of these investigators, and I am so honored that he has agreed to speak with us today about his scholarship and about his research. And here at this moment, let me turn over to Mark Williams to um, introduce Professor Wanunu. Mark, before I do that, just for one second, let me say to you all, we are so glad to have you with us, to have our parents, our friends, our alumni, um, anyone who is interested joining us for these wonderful events. We are so grateful to you for your support of the College of Science and of the Physics Department. And um, I want to extend my sincere gratitude to those of you who are our supporters and who will be our supporters for years to come. You are part of the Northeastern family and we are thrilled that you are. And so with that, let me turn over to Professor Mark Williams who is the chair of our Physics Department. Uh, thank you, Hazel. Uh, so it is a pleasure to introduce Manny Wanunu. Uh, Manny earned his PhD from the Weizmann Institute and held research positions at the University of Pennsylvania and Boston University before joining the faculty at Northeastern in 2011. He is funded by and serves as a regular panelist for the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, in addition to serving as an academic editor of two journals, uh, PLOS One and Journal of Nanobiotechnology. Since 2017, Professor Wanunu has served as the graduate director in the physics department, which is my old job before I became chair. Um, and uh, he's also a co-director of Northeastern's uh, Costas Advanced Nano Characterization Facility at Burlington, in the Burlington campus of Northeastern, uh, which specializes in atomic resolution electron-based imaging. Uh, Many is an advisory board member at the Harvard University Center for Nanoscale Systems. Um, throughout his career, he's been devoted to increasing diversity in science and physics as a leader in the HHMI funded uh, faculty training workshops, diversity and faculty training workshops, and he's also a member of the Physics Department Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, Manny uh, Wanunu is a true innovator in the field of biophysics. He has a large and productive research group where he is constantly developing new methods for use in diagnostic tools such as DNA sequencing, as well as tools for understanding how biomolecules function, as he will discuss today. Uh, so many, let me uh, turn it over to you. Uh, welcome. Uh, 
Okay, uh, well, thank you, uh, Mark, and thank you, Hazel, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen, and uh, and then I'll continue my my, uh, my my welcoming greetings to everyone. So, hopefully, you can all see this full screen. Um, so, thank you all for for joining today, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. I, I really um, am pleased to be a part of the college. I think it's uh, it's seen a upwards trajectory uh, since I since I joined, you know, that we've hired an amazing group of uh, colleagues who are now junior to me and, and it's it's fun to, to, to see it, to see that group grow and and do really nice things in all aspects of physics, um, including biophysics, but also in condensed matter and high energy and other other fields. Uh, what I'll talk about today is my research in nanoscale biophysics. Uh, and I'll describe a little bit of my research um, specifically on nanopores in, in some detail because I'd like, like to uh, give you a feel for what nanopores are and what they do. Uh, some of you might have heard of nanopores being used for sequencing uh, DNA molecules, and I'll describe a little bit of that, but also um, a little bit of the history of the field and what we can do with nanopores for looking at the uh, structures and functions and dynamics of biomolecules. So the main premise of uh, research, diagnosis and treatment in, in biology is that there is a molecular state. The molecular state is basically, if you think of all the assembly of molecules that are there in a cell um, and their positions, their function, their structure, their dynamics govern um, how a cell behaves and what it does, right? I mean, it's all at any given time, if you take a snapshot, there's a picture where, where you have molecules in space arranged and they're sort of, doing their thing, um, whether it's copying DNA molecules, making RNA molecules, making proteins, and, and, and you know, shuttling proteins from one compartment to another, and so on and so forth. And that state, um, you know, when, when you think about diagnosis and treatment, 99% of, of, of you know, the, these molecules are proteins, right? You think about proteins. But uh, nowadays, it's more and more accepted that DNA and RNA play roles as well. So it's not just the proteins that are actually doing something apart from copying information. Um, you know, DNA and RNA molecules also play roles by virtue, by, by, by the fact that they have uh, structures, they, they have structures, they have spatial topologies that, are, that govern their activities, and uh, they also have enzymatic roles and so on. So evaluating the molecular state of cells, which includes proteins and nucleic acids, is critical for progress and for understanding and maintaining health. So uh, one other point to keep in mind is that our genome is pretty constant, right? Our DNA, you know, our genome to 99.9% .9 of our genomes are pretty much identical. Um, however, we know that our cells are not the same, right? They, they differentiate, they, they're, you know, they're differentiating in different ways and they're, they have different activities and different functions and specializations. And that's, a lot of it is dictated by the epigenome. A lot of that is dictated by subtle chemical changes that happen to those cells. So there's an additional layer of information beyond the primary kind of information that you're taught in you know, your undergrad biochemistry or even high school biochemistry or biophysics, uh, sorry, biology class, um, where you just learn about the primary structure of molecules, there's also a secondary uh, level to that primary structure, which includes some chemical changes that, that dynamically happen and dynamically modulate the way cells behave. So another kind of example that's more recent in biology is the, well, it's, it's not as recent anymore as it was 10 years ago, uh, but it is uh, recent in, you know, in the last 20 years of um, RNA interference or microRNAs. These are small RNAs that tremendously impact differentiation. And you can see some of these uh, uh, pl uh, plots here that show how in different stages of fertilization, there are different microRNAs that, that go up and down in concentrations in response to uh, the need to differentiate uh, an organism in different, and you, they are specialized in different so, uh, regions of that organism. So there's different kinds and a huge amount of diversity of RNAs uh, that, that play tremendous roles in addition to the proteins that are there. Um, so my point is that probing the cellular world, right, and the extracellular world, right, things that are large molecules that are kind of swimming outside of those cells requires very sensitive tools, right? There's a huge amount of variability in space, in time, um, and also um, 
the number of molecules, the, the, the amount of information, the molecular information that's there is not so tremendous when you talk about a single cell level, right? So one life unit, which is a cell, contains about a picogram level of information. So picograms of, of whatever it is, the nucleic acid proteins or so, um, of information for each one of those proteins. That's approximate, right? The picogram is sort of this um, kind of order of magnitude, right? Um, so when you think about the ways to analyze those molecules, you think about DNA sequencing, you think about proteomics, right? We have a world expert in proteomics in-house, Nikolai Slavov here, um, who does single cell proteomics and you can pretty much identify different proteins present in a cell, right? Um, when it comes to DNA sequencing, um, the predominant and the most high throughput method for DNA sequencing involves second generation methods, in which case you take a sample of DNA and you amplify it and you make tiny libraries of many, many copies of the same molecule because you need to be able to sequence, uh, to have enough signal to sequence from many, many molecules. Um, and what happens is when you do that, that you lose a lot of fidelity in the way that you're copying that DNA. Uh, you lose, you have a lot of gaps that are caused by regions which are not amplified to the same extent as other regions and you have other sorts of problems like that. Um, so in order to actually have a good way of communicating and understanding the molecular um, environment, you really need a sensor. You need something that's of the scale of the size of those molecules. You need something that's nanoscale so that you can basically meet the molecule in the, at its scale, right? Uh, and the question is, is now technology, which is a field that really started you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, is, it, is it mature enough to deliver, you know, to deliver such a sensor? And, and I guess the answer that I want to tell you today is that in part, yes, it's not there yet, but it's definitely getting there. So I'm going to start by introducing a little bit about nanopores and what they do. Um, and for that, I need to give you a little bit of a physics picture of a nanopore. So this is a side view of a pore. So what you have here is a membrane. And the membrane is basically outlined by this colored, um, you know, two, two it's a slice through a membrane. So you're seeing the side view of it. Benny, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're muted. Still muted. <laughs> Diana, maybe there's some something you could do to help us here. No worries. We'll get you back. Okay, I'm so sorry. No worries. Can you hear me We're now? Here. <laughs> yeah, All right. I'm really sorry. What happened was that uh, my, oh, okay, I'll continue. Well, Never mind. I, I was Never starting mind. to explain. We understand, thank you. Okay, so uh, the, nano, the basics of nanopore is that you have a membrane uh, and I'm showing the cr cross-sectional view of the membrane. Um, and when you apply a voltage across that membrane, um, you basically generate a net, ion flow across the membrane. Um, that ion flow it, is dictated by the direction of the electric field that's generated at the pore. And um, I'm showing you here an example of, a, of what a solid state nanopore would look like. And this is a pore that we make in solid state membranes that are very thin. Um, so we actually take an electric 
electron being focused on a very small point in space right on the membrane so that it ablates that material and makes a few nanometer diameter pore. And the thickness of that material is also a few nanometers, you know, up to 10 nanometers or so. Um, and I'll describe why that's very critical in just a minute. Um, but when you apply this voltage across the pore, you have electrodes that are quite far away. They're, they're millimeters away from the membrane, but all the electric field that you generate is not diffuse in space. It's actually very localized. It's, the reason it's very localized is because there's no impedance to ion flow in the bulk, but there is a very strong impedance to ion flow at the pore. So all of the ions are sort of waiting to go, to go through the pore, if you, if you will. And that generates a very localized electric field, which is very important because that localized electric field is where the sensing happens. So any small fluctuations in what's in the pore at any given time will dictate the magnitude of the current, will dictate the resolution of the pore. Um, so this is what a, a current voltage curve would look like for a nanopore. You just have a linear response. If you, if you increase the voltage, you get more current. You, you decrease the voltage, you get less current. Um, and then the basic premise, as I said, is that if you have an object that blocks the pore, you're going to lower that current level. So let's take an example of that. And we're going to measure single molecules. So what do we do? We, we add some molecules here in the chamber, in this top chamber, and we apply voltage. And this is just a representation, a physics representation of a protein molecule, which is basically just a sphere. And when we apply voltage, what we end up getting is we get um, the steady state uh, kind of uh, current, right? Which is this flat line here that's kind of noisy. But then you see these individual pulses. Each one of these pulses corresponds to the passage of a single protein molecule through the pore. Um, so what you can do now is you can count these proteins. You can sort of see how many proteins are going through the pore so you can get their concentration. Um, but you can also get more information such as their size and their uh, characteristics. And I'll describe a little bit about those characteristics in just a second. Uh, so when you magnify these pulses and you kind of look deep into what kind of current signals they provide, you see that they actually provide you with a decrease in the current level and then a rise back to the normal current level. Um, so this, these peaks are very fast. They're a microsecond. So we need very sophisticated electronics to detect those, those peaks uh, with high fidelity. So what I'd like to argue here is that because we are making these very fast measurements of protein uh, transport through the pore, I'd like to argue that we're actually taking snapshots of these protein structures uh, because their large scale conformational changes in proteins happen on a much slower scale than the transit times of these proteins through the pore. So, so I show here a little camera because we're actually taking in a way snapshots of the protein state for each molecule that goes through the pore. And then we take statistics and we can infer from that the, the population of the proteins. So here you see, for example, um, these are the mean amplitudes. So what you're looking at is basically a statistical analysis of many, many pulses for three different proteins. Uh, one of them is GFP, green fluorescent protein, which is green. <laughs> Uh, and then you have protein ACE-K and phe 29 polymerase. So these are three different proteins. They have different molecular weights. Um, the larger proteins will block more of the pore. So phe 29 polymerase obviously is larger. It blocks more of the current. So it basically resides in a deeper amplitude. And then you have the smaller proteins uh, blocking less. Um, but in addition to just the means, the means of these distributions, there's another factor which we found very interesting. And that is that the broadness, the width of these distributions changes in response to whatever proteins we're looking at. And that led to a very interesting discovery by my student Pradeep uh, Waduja when he did his PhD, is that if you look at the broadness of those peaks, you can actually infer something about the flexibility of these proteins. So if you take a protein which is very stiff, like green fluorescent protein, uh, green fluorescent protein is composed of these beta sheets. It's, a, it's basically a beta turn that keeps going uh, around the barrel, it's a beta barrel. And that beta barrel is very stiff. It's, very, it's one of the most stiff proteins that's basically known uh, because it, beta sheets are typically more uh, stiff than, than alpha helical um, you know, uh, motifs. Uh, if you compare that with a very flexible protein like comodulin, for example, which is something that, that undergoes large conformational changes and has a lot of alpha helical character, you see a very big, um, no, a very noticeable um, with changes in the distribution. So what I'm plotting here is the root mean square fluctuation from simulations. So these are molecular dynamic simulations conducted by Paul Whitford in our department 
uh, and you can see that it correlates very well with these um, distribution widths that we get from the experiments. So in a way, we have access to protein flexibility here in these measurements, which is very, which was the kind of the new thing that was discovered. Um, this is another way of looking at this. You can sort of see the um, alpha helical to beta sheet ratio and how that correlates with the stiffness of these proteins. Uh, and that correlates very well with um, other measurements made by others, uh, for, you know, young modulus measure measurements made from AFM, uh, atomic force microscopy, um, and neutron scattering measurements. Um, so one of the challenges, as I mentioned to you, is that these pulses are very fast and you need very sophisticated tools to measure these very fast pulses. Um, one way to slow things down, and that was very useful for us in order to detect very subtle um, uh, protein changes, is by using a combination of two different forces to push molecules through the pore. So for example, what we can do is we can apply pressure. Um, this would be hydrostatic pressure to push proteins through the pore. So here we're pushing proteins through the pore from top to bottom, right? But we can also use voltage to then retard the protein transport, right? So we can, in a way, use two different forces to neutralize that, that force, to neutralize that uh, transit time. Um, so what I'm showing you here is basically this contraption that was, you know, pressure and voltage um, used at the same time to, to look at a very nice um, conformational change that's induced by a binding of um, adenylate kinase to a, a substrate, which is actually a lock substrate. So this is AP5A, which is aden uh, it's a five phosphate groups that bridge together two adenosines. Um, and adenylate kinase actually has two binding sites for ADP, uh, this, this molecule is basically two ADPs linked together with a phos phosphate group. And in a way, once it binds, it kind of stays there because it doesn't know what to do. It can't digest that phosphate group. So it just stays in a closed conformational state. So it's a very good substrate for us to analyze uh, using the pore to, con to convince ourselves that what we're looking at is a conformational change. And indeed, you can see that the APO protein, which does not have the AP5A, has a very broad distribution that encompasses the closed and open states Whereas upon addition of the AP5A, only the closed state is represented by the histogram. Uh, and this was done in collaboration with Lee Mikowski, who's um, the bioengineering chair in, at Northeastern now. Um, so we've also looked at uh, mutants of proteins. And this, is, this was the most fascinating thing that I ever seen because um, I, ne I never realized how a single mut mutation in a protein can affect its dynamics. Uh, and this is something that, um, uh, was very surprising to me. These are studies. What you see here in the middle histogram is studies from uh, uh, from fluorescence mi uh, microscopy based on the fact that hydrophobic patches in a protein will yield higher fluorescence when this ANS is added to the to the protein sample. So uh, this is a, an alternative way of measuring protein flexibilities by uh, adding this ANS and measuring fluorescence in a way. So these are a series of nine different mutants. Um, of, um, of the uh, dihydrofolate reductase, which is an enzyme, a prominent enzyme in, in different species. Um, and these are single mutants. Some of them are double mutants, but most of them are single mutants. And you can see here, they vary quite dramatically in their uh, flexibility. And what we've done is basically taken these, these biz ANS measurements and correlate them with nanopore measurements. And you can see this uh, very nice correlation between the two. Um, these are the blue and the red lines represent the correlation. Okay, so now we are going, going to switch gears a little bit. And what I'd like to describe to you is how we make uh, small and thin solid state pores. So what I mentioned to you before is that the resolution of a pore really is determined by um, you know, how, how the current is blocked when a molecule get, gets in there. But uh, what I didn't mention to you is that uh, the resolution is actually a func an inverse function of the thickness of the pore. So if you reduce the thickness of the pore, you're actually sensing a smaller region in space of that molecule. So you can have a higher resolution, which is very important for sequencing. So how do we make these very small and thin pores? That's a very big challenge because um, electron beams are very aggressive and they kind of ablate material very quickly. And it's very hard to make very thin pores that are that have very small holes. So um, this is based on some sort of a discovery that was uh, done by one of my postdocs, Hirohito Yamazaki, who is now in the University of Tokyo. Um, and what you see here is basically a, a silicon nitride membrane where 
we've taken a visible laser, this is uh, a green laser, um, uh, and just focus it down to diffraction limits. So it's basically just uh, you know half a micron um, dot, right? All that laser power hits hits the silicon nitride in just a half a micron spot. Um, and what we've noticed is that when you focus the laser or wherever there's a pore, there's a very drastic and very quick rise in the current in the current of the pore. And we were wondering why this happens. And this was observed earlier by in 2013 um, uh, by another group. Uh, and we, the, the explanation that was given is basically that this is an increase in the surface charge of the pore. Um, and we wanted to investigate this further to see what was exactly going on. So we wanted to basically um, outline the, the, what's happening when a current is, uh, when the current increases so drastically, how does that happen? Um, and how does that affect molecular transport? So what the first thing we did is we tried to investigate what are the changes in the surface charge that happen when current uh, when, when the laser is hitting the pore. So in order to get the surface charge change, I just wanted to describe that a little bit. Uh, what we've done is basically construct a pressure cell so we can apply pressure to the pore and push fluid through the pore. And the idea is that when you push fluid through the pore, if it has a surface charge, it's going to have counter ions that are going to be also flowing through the pore. That's called the streaming current. And by looking at the potential required to, to neutralize that streaming current, you can actually get the, um, the, the surface charge of the pore. If the pore is not charged, there's not going to be any net current flow. It's just going to be cations and anions flowing through the pore. But if there is a charge, there's going to be only counter ions flowing through the pore, an excess of counter ions flowing through the pore. So, um, the, so the streaming potential, which is basically the potential that's required to neutralize that streaming current, um, can be measured directly by this uh, by this tool. And this is what a curve would look like. You would increase the pressure over time, and you would see what happens. So you would see what happens to the streaming potential, which is measured by our amplifier, right? So this is just an example. And what we noticed, uh, this is just a sanity check, right? We changed the pH of the pore, and we can see that the surface charge reverses, right? Whereas the potential increases for high pH, for low pH, the potential decreases, which tells us that we've reversed the surface charge of the pore. And when we measure that in the absence and presence of lasers, we realize that the surface charge does not really change that much. So it really changes by only 10 or 20%, which is not enough to explain any current change um, uh, that we observed before. Um, so in order to explain that, um, we looked into the optical effect that you know, the laser might have on the nitride, on the silicon nitride. So we measured the absorption spectrum of silicon nitride. Silicon nitride is just a material that's deposited by combining silane and ammonia at high temperatures, and it basically decomposes into something that contains silicon, nitrogen, and some oxygen, which is inevitable. Uh, you know, we live in a world of oxygen, so there's always some oxygen there. Um, there's, there is an absorption band that you see here in blue that absorbs right at the very center of where we're illuminating our laser. So our laser is 532 nanometers, green laser. So it's right at the very center almost of the absorption band. So when we turn on the, the laser, we're actually causing electrons right, to absorb light. And when they absorb light, they get to an excited state. And then that excited state releases uh, some either light, right, which is what you see here. This is for the photoluminescence spectrum, or it releases heat. Right. If it, if there's non-radiative emission, it just releases heat back. So it basically cycles. You're, you're using these electrons to cycle heat um, in and out of the system, well, out of the system by cycling the electrons. Um, now, when there is also a photoluminescence effect, you see the emission of light here, right? Which is this red curve. So when you look at the efficiency of that, how efficient is that? So if I put one photon in, do I get one photon out? And the answer is no. For every um, one photon in, you only get 0 0.07 photons out. So it's only 7% efficient, that quantum yield. So the rest of that, the rest of that light that, you know, that is absorbed by the system just gets out as heat, right? So when you quantify how much that heats up the system, it turns out that it explains precisely the increase in the, in the magnitude of the current that we observe. So it actually was sort of a mystery solved situation um, and, now you can get the temperature profiles near the pore and you can actually affect temperatures very quickly by just you know, shining light at the pore. So you can actually use that as a temperature knob 
you can just heat up the pore instantly and do experiments where you're melting molecules. Um, you, you're doing everything that you want to do thermally to a molecule within nanoseconds or microseconds at the pore, which is, which is, you know, which is great. And it's very localized, so it doesn't affect the other molecules that you're about to interrogate later. And just to illustrate this, um, I wanted to show you that, uh, for example, if you take a, a methanol or, or any solvent and you, uh, you heat that methanol locally, you heat that solvent locally, you're going to get a nucleation um, of a bubble, but the nucleation temperature is much higher than the bulk, melting temp uh, bulk, bulk boiling temperature um, of, the, um, of the solvent. Um, so the, it's much higher because it, small bubbles they, you know, require a lot of pressure to be kind of inflated. Um, so the, the boiling point is the point at which the um, atmospheric pressure is equal to the vapor pressure of the solvent but the nucleation point of a bubble is actually at a higher temperature. And this was confirmed by these microheaters that were made um, here in platinum. Um, that is a separate paper. But what I wanted to show you is that this is just a confirmation of the effect of the heat that we're uh, claiming uh, accounts for this. So if you take a, a solution of methanol, um, the question is, does it absorb light, right? And the answer is, if you look at a bottle of methanol, you can tell right away it does not absorb light, right? It's a transparent solvent. So light goes right through it. It's just like glass, right? So if I take my pore here, um, sorry, membrane, and I just turn on the laser, what you'll see, there's methanol on both sides. You see that immediately we generate a bubble, right? That means we, we've exceeded 100 uh, Celsius by that laser, OK? So the fact that we've done that just demonstrates that we're heating the pore. And that was very useful. That was a very useful new technology to affect uh, molecules at the pore. Um, in addition to, uh, so why, why do I care about temperature aside from affecting molecules? Well, I can also use that temperature and use that increased chemical reactivity of silicon nitride uh, in order to make pores, which was the, the really nice thing. Um, so what you could do is you could take a silicon nitride membrane, which has a certain thickness and just shine light on it, focus, focus light. And what we observe is that it actually slowly thins the membrane, right? So you can see that the membrane gradually gets thinner. This is just a you know, uh, cartoon here, but you can actually see AFM, atomic force microscopy images of the effect of the laser at different times and different powers on the silicon nitride thickness. So we can actually machine silicon nitride at relatively mild conditions. You know, usually it takes uh, very aggressive chemistry to, to affect the thickness and to sculpt silicon nitride. Uh, but in this case, we can just take a KCL solution and just apply a laser pulse and just, you know, and just uh, manipulate the thickness of the nitride. And we propose some, some mechanism for this, some chemical mechanism for this. But the, the nice thing is that now we can actually have very locally thin regions, which are extremely thin, and then we can apply a voltage, uh, you know, relatively high voltage, you know, a volt or so across the pore at the same time. And when we do that, we can actually make a pore, we can actually puncture a pore. And this is based on uh, pioneering work by one of my colleagues, uh, Vincent Tavartkosa, who's at, who's at uh, University of Ottawa. Um, he developed the, the electric breakdown method. And we're basically combining this for the thermal dissolution method with that, and we can get very, very thin, very, very small pores. So this is just a a picture of this of the schematic of the setup, and this is what uh, uh, what happens when you were to do an experiment like this. You would be measuring no current. Um, there's thinning. Oops, sorry. There's thinning going on the whole time, and then as soon as a pore is formed, you see the increase in the current, right? Because now you have a lot of ions to go through the pore. So we, then we turn off the the laser and we turn off the voltage or turn down the voltage, um, and then we have a working pore that we can use and. Um, we can make such small and such thin pores that we can measure uh, single molecules of tRNA, transfer RNA molecules, and DNA molecules, and, and protein molecules. So um, the amazing thing about, about this technology is that we can make very thin pores. So the effective thickness is plotted on the y-axis, um, and it's basically you know, down to a nanometer or so, uh, even less sometimes. Um, and then the diameters are listed in each pore that we've made for this publication that we did here. So you can make very, very small, like less than two nanometer pores with less than two nanometers thickness, which is getting to the point where this might be useful for DNA sequencing.
So um, just to, to mention that uh, in, in, in applying these very small and very thin pores, what we have in mind is basically, uh, and we've been putting, to, putting in uh, proposals to NASA to deploy such an instrument that makes its own pores, basically uh, autonomously using light source and using the membranes uh, in space. So there's a search for life and other planets, right? And um, in that search for life, you need detectors that are able to identify biopolymers in places where it's very difficult to do so, especially since you don't know what kind of biopolymers might be there, right? Because life is very um, arbitrary in a way, right? On Earth, we know exactly the structure of DNA molecules, but we also know that that structure has evolved over millions of years from, you know, from the DNA and from the lipids and, and from uh, the composition of proteins. So uh, the question is what kind of life might be there? Um, well, no one knows. Um, what, me, what might be there on other planets, and no one knows what the composition of the backbone of DNA is right, in, in other planets or, the, uh, or any information carrying molecule. So um, a general tool would be useful to study this, perhaps would be nanopores. Nanopores could, could identify um, based on the pulses and based on interpretation of these pulses, one can deduce whether it's a charged polymer, uh, whether it's linear, um, and what's the sort of uh, length of the polymer and the composition of the polymer in terms of the, the not the maybe not the sequence because we don't know what the building blocks are, but at least we'll be able to identify if it's a polymer or something else like a particle, right? Um, so, so we, hopefully we'll be able to get that NASA funding to do that. Um, another point is that nanopores can be used to unfold proteins, and this is becoming a very big deal nowadays, where people are trying to um, just you know, getting getting beyond DNA sequencing, getting beyond RNA sequencing, both of which are available today, people are trying to unfold proteins and be able to um, to to look at their primary structure just by reading them. And so, so these this is one example where one of these pores that uh, Hero made uh, was used to unfold the protein and get some uh, spatial uh, sorry temporal information that might uh, be related to the, the primary structure of the protein. So we're trying to, that's a very challenging problem. There are 20 amino acids, so it's, it's a lot of diversity in how the signals might be, but it, it requires a lot of uh, tools, including machine learning tools and others in order to deduce the structure of proteins, but that might be very useful in understanding um, you know, variability in, in single protein molecules, which is a very difficult problem, even from mass spectrometry. Um, finally, just on the protein end, I just wanted to highlight a paper by one of my postdocs, Prabhat Tripathi, who just published um, his work on cytochrome C. And um, what came out is a very interesting, uh, uh, a very interesting phenomenon is that you can actually use electric fields to unfold proteins. Um, so you can actually apply um, voltage across a pore. And what happens is that cytochrome C molecules, which reside at the mouth of the pore, uh, normally, they're not able to translocate the pore because the pore is slightly smaller than the size of the protein. But as you increase the, the field, uh, you can induce that unfolding. And um, in collaboration with uh, Paul Champion, who's also in our department, um, and the simulations person, Alexi Eximentev at Urbana, we were able to, um, to, to say something about how this electrical unfolding takes place. And you can see here these unfolding curves at different guanidinium concentrations. Um, so we're basically using electric fields to unfold the proteins, um, but uh, these are modulated obviously by other denaturants. Uh, the nice thing is that the unfolding energetics uh, can be deduced and they're actually very much in agreement with uh, other types of measurements that were done, you know, early biophysical experiments that were done. So this is very exciting because using electric fields to unfold proteins is not something that's very common. And we're exploring that further with other groups now. So I just, in the last five minutes or so, I just wanted to give you a little bit on um, our other kind of half of the, what the other half of the lab does, which is basically um, optical DNA sequencing. So we're looking at um, a process where if we're trying to read the molecular state of a cell uh, and we're trying to read the molecular state uh, of a DNA molecule, for example, um, then why not track it in real time? Why not try to replicate it in real time and deduce its structure? Uh, and of course, that question was not asked by me. That question was asked by others uh, many, many years ago. Uh, this, is a, this is a movie that was uh, generated by Pacific Biosciences. It was a company 
uh, a company that started about 15 or 15 plus years ago. Um, and they basic their their go their goal was to basically track DNA polymerases um, as they synthesized the complementary strand of a DNA molecule. So they're basically eavesdropping in the polymerase. In, in, that's kind of their words. <laughs> um, but what what their clever their clever technology in, includes a couple of key elements. One is the zero mode waveguide, which is called ZMW. The zero mode waveguide is an optical element that is very confined in space. It's about 100 nanometers in all dimensions. And it's basically a well in a metallic film. So here you have a metallic film, and here you have a 100 nanometer well. You can see the top view on the bottom of that well. And if you immobilize a single polymerase right at the very center where that arrow is, um, you can shine light from the bottom and collect light only from a very small ring around this very bottom of the surface. Um, and so it's a very confined way of collecting fluorescence emission from molecules. And when you do that, if you couple that to another um, innovation, which is basically the use of fluorescent uh, nucleotides with different colors, um, then you can actually read which incoming nucleotides are being incorporated into the DNA molecule. And when you, of course, multiplex that, then you can achieve the throughput that you need in order to compete with the Illumina system um, that is of extremely high throughput. Um, the nice thing about following single molecules as opposed to following the bulk, you know, Illumina, for example, where you make many copies of that molecule. When you follow a single molecule, you can actually get much more information than just the sequence. You can actually get um, information about the particular DNA template that's being read. So here's an example where the template contains a modification in the DNA. So it contains a methylation site, for example, right? And that methylation sites lead the, lead the polymerase to think that it might take a bit longer to, to find the cognate uh, base that's about to enter. So if you have a methyl adenine in your template, you can see that thymine might take a little bit longer to be incorporated than if you just have a normal adenine template, as you see here. So in a way, by tracking the kinetics of the polymerase, you can induce deduce something about the uh, structure of the template. So that allows you to then, when, you, when you're reading the same molecule a bunch of times, um, you can actually see um, DNA modifications directly. So you can actually measure them in a single molecule. And having that single molecule power, really, there's nothing like it because you're, 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 uh, there's a lot of var variability in molecules. And when you sort of make copies of those molecules and you're basically making a different machine, a different beast that uh, does not give you high fidelity, does not give you any information about the original sample. Um, so in a way, this is a, uh, a way of just reading the native state of the, of the molecular system. But one of the challenges with this, with this method is that uh, this is a pretty old slide, I admit. Uh, things have gotten better with PacBio. But um, one of the challenges has been, and still is to some extent, longer molecules have a very low efficiency of getting loaded into these wells. Uh, because the size of DNA molecules, as it increases, it competes with the size of these wells. It becomes bigger than the size of these wells. So getting them into the well requires some force, requires some you know, kind of pushing them in. Um, and you can see that right here, you can see that the yield of sequencing really decreases very drastically with the insert size. Um, so what we've actually done um, is to go from a passive way uh, of loading these DNA molecules into a well um, to an active way where we actually use electric field to capture molecules into the wells. And this was a scheme that was um, uh, drawn by Hagen Bailey, uh, who highlighted uh, uh, my student's paper on, on this topic. Uh, and what we're using is the electric field, which is induced by the pore that's underneath the well here. You see the little hole in the bottom. And we're basically applying electric fields to capture molecules in, and then using the chemistry to immobilize them into the wells. Um, so this is an example of this nanopore zero mode waveguide, uh, which we uh, produced in collaboration with PacBio, but supported by the NIH. Um, and when we integrate that with a microscope that's able to look at spectroscopy of molecules, uh, so you can identify these four different colors from each well at any given time, then you can actually sequence DNA. And I'll show you a movie. Uh, maybe I can skip this one just to show you that this is, shows you that you have a high capture yield. Uh, but here's a movie where it shows you the sequencing, where you can actually see that different bases are incorporated 
Um, and each time a base is incorporated with a different color, it shows up in a different position on the CCD. So um, basically the, the green rectangle and the red rectangle represent two different waveguides and the, the height of the pulse represents the color of the, um, of the dye. So from this, if you just read out which colors are incorporated, you can get the DNA sequence. And this is for 20,000 base pair molecules. So it's not trivial to load these molecules. Uh, and we loaded them from something around on the order of 100 picograms of input material in, in just you know, seconds, which is something that would require many, many hours, if not a day, to, to do in a PEC biosystem. Um, so uh, base calling yields uh, reads that align to template. We, we're you know, th this is one of the biggest challenges we're facing now is actually getting the accuracy high enough. Um, so this was this is still work in progress, believe it or not. But it's um, it's it, you know it's it's a question of uh, um, the, the base calling itself is a question of really um, understanding uh, uh, in a way the kinetics of the polymerase, but also uh, the the noise, the st you know statistical noise of how polymerase um, incorporates and what constitutes an incorporation, what constitutes noise, and it's it's not as easy as it may seem, but it's um, it's something that's work in progress, and we're definitely improving that. But I, uh, what I'm my final slide is basically to show you that we've kind of found a way to get away from these the need to make these nanopores at each one of these wells, and now we're using built-in electrodes to to capture molecules. So this is something again new. Something that PacBio does not use, does not have, but uh, we're trying to to get that incorporated into their system, and this way you'll be able to actually achieve single molecule, a single cell uh, DNA sequencing, uh, without having to do any amplification technology, any amplification uh, steps. Uh, so this is a chip that would uh, that uh, that you have uh, these wells, you have these zero mode waveguides, and you have a platinum electrode, uh, which is contacted by this gold pin in the back here. So that every waveguide can basically be applied a voltage uh, with respect to the solution where you have your DNA molecules. So you can actually load DNA molecules using this voltage. Um, and and these are this is a picture of the waveguides. And using this system, we can capture very efficiently. Uh, the the innovation here about this waveguide is that you have the the aluminum film here, and then you have the electric film here. This this insulating film that's down here. Uh, that's shown by this intermediate layer. And then the bottom, the black layer is actually a platinum layer. This is the, the electrode layer that actually captures molecules. Um, and then we can load DNA molecules very efficiently. This is just how over time you can see how DNA molecules are incorporated. This is just yo-yo labeled DNA. So it's just a fluorescent labeled DNA. So you can see the loading. Uh, and you can see over time how this thing gets loaded. Um, so we're very excited about these new devices and we're actually, I think Fatume, just very close to uh, wrapping up her paper. We just waited on the, the base calling software for, for the sequencing, and now we're um, almost ready to go to, to finalize this publication, which will be hopefully a big, um, generated a lot of enthusiasm um, in the field. So there are other projects uh, going on that I obviously did not get to talk about, uh, some of them including the MinION uh, DNA sequencing, uh, which we're working with Sarah Hunnefard's lab on. Um, microbial isolation using Gullivers, which we're working with Slava Epstein's group on um, desalination. So we're also, because we're working with pores, we have um, access to single pores, but also uh, an array of pores uh, that we were making. And we're trying to do water desalination using that. Uh, DNA reporters for portable biomarker detection. So um, we're uh, developing ways of chopping up DNA into pieces which are specific depending on the biomarker that's attached to them. Uh, nucle uh, NucSeq is basically um, nucleosome sequencing. So we're using, we're trying to identify nucle nucleosome histone modifications in nucleosomes and correlate that with sequence of DNA. So where sequence is bound um, in nucleosomes that are extracted directly from cells um, and what the histone modifications are. Um, and then 2D material pores for high resolution sequencing and and the latest thing, which is the basically the highest carrot on the stick, is single molecule protein sequencing. Uh, so at that point, I'd like to just thank my group uh, who did all the work here. Um, some of this work has been done by former members of my group, uh, but my current group now um, is Dr. Prabhat, um, and then all the grad students. There are actually a good mix between physics and bioengineering, and I'm very happy um, to have them in my group. And of course, funding and my collaborators. So thank you all.
That is great, Manny. Thank you so much for your presentation. We really appreciate that. Um, there are a number of questions here. Um, do you want to keep your screen sharing or do you want to give us back you? Yeah, uh, let me let me give you uh, let me give you myself go, back. Man. Fabulous. And now I can see the chat too. So Good, right. I will let's see um what's here i think um maybe we should start with something that's you know really the basics when when you talk about nanotechnology what does that mean do you think is it one meaning or are there a whole bunch of you know things that are put into this basket called nanotechnology yeah so um I, it's funny you should ask that that's a great question because when i started my uh, phd at the weizmann institute um the journal nanoletters came out for the first time, I think it must have been 2001 or so, if I'm not mistaken. But we always thought it was, what is nano? Like we, we, we were working in nanotechnology, but we couldn't even define what is nano. Um, but basically, nanotechnology is uh, the way that I've traditionally learned to think about nanotechnology is that um, as you reduce the dimensions of an object to the nanoscale, and at that time I was working with nanoparticles, so it made sense. Uh, for example, if you take a gold nugget, a big gold nugget, right? It has the color of gold, it reflects light like gold does, right? But if you chop it up into little pieces and those pieces become smaller than you know, a few hundred nanometers, the, the, the shape and the way that the, the, the particle interacts with light is different. And it basically starts to absorb light and starts to have these oscillations of electrons and light and, and, it, and it has different colors and it has these beautiful new emergent phenomena that are, that are happening. Um, in the case of nanopores, actually, I have to say that nanopores are very classical and they behave exactly the same way. They're scaleless in a way because you can take a two nanometer pore and a hundred nanometer and a, and a micron size pore, and they would behave the same way. And the reason for that is that ions that flow through the pore are still much smaller than the size of these pores. So in a way, there are many ions that flow through the pores um, and it, it scales in a way that doesn't really depend on the size of the pore. But to answer your question about the nanotechnology, Nanotechnology, um, basically, um, the way I would define it now is that it's not necessarily emergent phenomena, but it's phenomena that that are at the scale of of nano um, molecule, like molecular size. You know, like anything that's uh, below 100 nanometers uh, that pretty much meets the size of a of a of a, of a large biomolecule. Um, you know. Um, so, I mean, it really depends because if, if you're measuring, you know, you could measure, uh, you know, a single hydrogen bond using nanotechnology, but you can also measure large biomolecules and you can, uh, so it depends on the kind of uh, nanostructure you're performing, but anything that's small. <laughs> is not... Hey, you got it. Yeah. Something that's really small. So yes. nanotechnology refers to really small stuff. Let's go to some of the um, other questions um, here, many. Sure. Um, yeah, I can. I can a read lot it. about pores, and the question here is: What what are these pores? Are these real pores that would be in cells normally that you're um, pushing your proteins through, or are they um, artificial in some way? Uh, where where do you get these pores from? How do you make them? Great question. So the uh, some of these pores are actually um, traditionally before solid state nanopores. They have been uh, generated by inserting membrane proteins, which are made from tox they're actually toxin pores. Uh, so alpha hemolysin is one of those toxins that's produced by Staph aureus. And it's, it's, uh, it basically invades, for example, red blood cells, right? And just takes all the ions, you know, out of there and, and kills the cell. Um, and that, that was one of the first pores that was demonstrated as a sensor, um, of, of, uh, of nucleic acids. Um, so traditionally, that those have been membrane proteins embedded into synthetic artificial planar lipid bilayers, and people would make like electrophysiological measurements by applying voltage across the this single channel. Uh, and then, um, just in the early 2000s, there have been a couple of papers, one from the Harvard group and one from the Delft group uh, in Netherlands, where they actually used synthetic membranes, silicon nitride and silicon oxide membranes, uh, and they actually punctured these holes in. Uh, using electron beams and using ion beams. Um, and then since then, there have been many, many examples of manufacture of pores ranging from, you know, taking carbon nanotubes and kind of embedding them in epoxy, slicing them and, and doing all sorts of, uh, you know, nan kind of like nano micro technologies to, to make these pores. But um, the kind of pores that we prefer to use are the ones that are 
the solid state, um, silicon nitride. And because we can control the size, we can match the size to our molecules and match the size to the system that we're trying to, to make. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We are almost out of time. So let's just take one quick, um, quick question here. And um, here's a very interesting, um, you know, we, you talked about pushing proteins through it and monitoring um, the different sort of structures of proteins. But here's a completely different question. Does this have anything to do with digital information storage? It's actually, I'm so glad you brought that up um, because I actually, there, there is actually a, a disclaimer that I almost forgot to, to place because I just recently joined the, the advisory board of a company called Catalog DNA. And that's a, it's a great time you brought it up because um, the Catalog DNA is, is a company that it's one of several companies who are aiming to use DNA for information storage. And the way that they do, the nice thing about DNA is that as you guys may know is that you can find DNA in, uh, you know, trapped in, in materials for millions of years, and then you can get that information out, right? Whereas a hard drive, um, and I've had many hard drives fail on me, especially ones in the lab with data, and it's very frustrating. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hard drives last for a few decades at most, right? Uh, whereas uh, DNA could last forever. So um, that company aims at, aims at uh, making uh, high throughput ways of writing information in DNA and, and then um, by reading it out in an efficient manner, you can actually use that for archival, you know, for information archival. And um, so, yeah, absolutely. So digital information storage is a major, major new um, technology. Some of the uh, uh, some of the companies that are interested in collaborating with the company that I'm, uh, you know, uh, advising is, is uh, for example, movie companies. They would like to store information for movies um, on DNA, right? So it would be very, very um, uh, something that would be real in the sometime in the future, uh, but one of the there there are many hurdles to that. One of them including uh, how to read all that information efficiently. Sure. sure. Brilliant. Many, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today, your outstanding scholarship, your, you know, completely novel view of dealing with um, biomolecules and information. We so appreciate your work. Um, you know, as, as Dean, I so appreciate that you're a member of the College of Science. Thank you for everything. Congratulations you. for the wonderful work from your research group. Thank you to everyone who attended. We're so glad to have you with us and we look Look forward to seeing you at the next Cost Connects seminar series. Thank you to everyone. Thanks, Al.